Hi everyone, this is uh, Howard Manwick. Welcome to the webinar today. Um, I have some cases to show you and David, David Godwin has two cases as well. So let me make sure that you can see my screen. Give me a second. David, can you see my screen okay now? Showing, showing yes. up? Yep, just fine. Good, okay. So let me start with a couple of devices. So I'll put up a two radiographs and you'll tell from the one on the left-hand side that new items are present compared to the prior. And you can see on the prior image that the patient has a CRTD device, which of course is intended to improve ejection fraction. But on the right hand side, we have in addition to that something else new. So I'll bring that up. And what we have new is some subcutaneous leads. We have another lead with a little bullet-shaped object over here and we also have a small ring, radio opaque ring in that location and I will mag this up now to show you that inferior to the radio opaque ring is a balloon containing gas which is right there. So we have an assist device that's associated with a balloon in distal aortic arch and descending aorta associated with some other items. So this is a investigational counter pulsation device. So it's very much akin to an IABP, except of course with an IABP, one is not and cannot be ambulatory, but the whole idea is can you develop a counterpulsation balloon device akin to an IABP that allows the patient to be ambulatory in a patient with chronic left ventricular failure? So the answer is yes, this is an investigational device produced by a company called NuPulse, and these are the components that you see there. We have the balloon. We have the device that um, is inserted via axillary or subclavian. We have subcutaneous leads. We have an internal drive line, some electronics, and this whole drive unit and battery, presumably. And this image really shows the small, the same thing, but kind of describes. So those of you that are watching the video online can pause for a moment just to read how this thing is put in via a small incision, access to the axial subclavian artery, and so on and so forth. So it's an interesting presumed alternative, for example, to a LVAD device, but a counterpulsation device. Hmm. And I think yeah, I do know that it was put in in a patient here in the context of a surgeon participating in a multicenter clinical trial of the device. So kind of interesting. Indeed. Here it is again. I still have to figure out exactly what that metal thing is, how it exactly works. Mm -hmm. I wonder what the um, battery life is, is how, how, um, how many hours the patient can be doing before yeah. recharging. Yeah, I don't know. But if you do want to look it up, it's called New Pulse, N U P U L S E, newpulse.com is where one could potentially find out more information about it. Or if you want to look up online, New Pulse. Here's another interesting one that I saw. The first time I saw this, I noticed it and I described it in my report of a chest radiograph, and this was some months ago. 
I didn't know what it was, and I think I tried to find out, but I was, and I can't quite remember why, I was unsuccessful in finding out what it was. And then I saw it again, and then a colleague of mine also saw it again, and ultimately we figured out what it is. So here is a patient with, as you can see, a um, bunch of devices, but the patient um, is being supported with central AV ECMO. The right atrial cannula is visible, but there is also a cannula not really visible on this bedside radiograph in the ascending aorta. And this was instituted in the context of surgery for a bicuspid valve, but it was complicated surgery, and they ultimately replaced the valve as well as a, as a graft for the ascending aorta. But let me show you the small object that piqued my interest, and it's this little guy right there, so it's really quite small. Let me bring up another radiograph to show you its shape. So it's like a little arrowhead or conical shaped object that projects over the heart. And it's there on multiple images, so it's real and it's somewhere in there. And then I will show you that on a subsequent CT that was done on this patient, not to evaluate the object, but because of complications that ensued the patient had a CT really for other reasons. And as part of that exam, you can see that here is the object. So it's real and it's located in the left ventricular cavity. And then I will try to show you that it actually is something that was placed into the patient via the right superior pulmonary vein. You may not catch all of it. Let's see, well, here it is. Let's see, let's make sure here it is. So it's placed that way. Let me just see if I got that right, because it's going through into the left atrium and it crosses the valve and ends up right there. So it's an additional thing that's placed at the time of surgery in this context, typically via right superior pulmonary vein into the left ventricle. So this turns out to be a left ventricular vent. That's what surgeons call that. So here is the context here. So if you want to read up about this and when this particular device may be placed, it's in this particular context. And here is this article. So in patients who are on central AV ECMO, and I'll show you in a moment, there is the possibility of pathological left ventricular distension that may occur. And the left ventricular distension with blood may be severe enough that there is left atrial hypertension and lung edema. And the other potential consequence of overdistension of left ventricle may be issues to do with opening and closing of the aortic valve. So the whole idea here is to decompress the left ventricle that is over distended. So let me show you here to go to the physiologic basis and I'll just mag this up. But you can read this over here describing how there is the possibility of left ventricular distension that is a problem. And typically during surgery, they may be able to diagnose that because of non pulsatile blood flow across the aortic valve, but particularly with transesophageal echo, in which on ultrasound one can see that the left ventricle is over distended. And then you can see here <clears throat> the consequences of the left ventricular distension or over distension. It talks here about where is the blood coming from that actually fills the left ventricle because we've got a cannula in the aorta, we've got a cannula in the right atrium, and it describes there must be a source of blood to fill the left ventricle, the heart must be unable to eject it. And they describe where the blood may be coming from. But basically, once you have that cannula 
or that left ventricular vent in place, the other side of the vent is connected to the, in this case, the venous cannula, the right atrial cannula, so that blood comes out of the left ventricle that's over distended into that cannula and then outside the body oxygenated if necessary and, and put back in. The other way to try to deal with this left ventricular over distension as they described in this article, if you don't put a vent in at the time of surgery when the patient's chest is open, is to, for example, use an impeller device to basically decompress the over distended left ventricle as described in this article. So kind of interesting pathophysiology and I really didn't have insight into that until actually very recently. So of course you'd have to be in a place where they use these devices perhaps to see such an eventuality as you can it's, see there. And they're different it seems that invented. Like an impella seems like a um, an easier thing to do you know, and right. less, right. lots less surgery, right. Now this of course was put in at the time of surgery, so here's an excerpt of the op note. When they did these procedures, they diagnosed or anticipated the problem and they put the vent in because the chest was open and they just put it through the, the superior pulmonary vein. As you can see there in this excerpt right there. Yep. So it was real and is kind of interesting. Didn't know about that. All right. Let me show you one more, then I'll let David show you some cases. So this one is, okay, this is another patient. So about a couple of weeks ago, I showed two patients from here with vaping associated lung injury and unknown to me at the time there was another patient that had been in our hospital that was ultimately diagnosed also with vaping associated lung injury the young patient so let me show you this t as well as the chest radiograph so the chest radiograph i'll show you first is the 16th and then i'll show you the six the uh, ct from the prior day so there's some ill-defined consolidative opacity that we can see in the right lower lung. <clears throat> Let's scroll through the CT that was done the previous day to get a feel for the appearance of the lung opacities in this patient. Um, bilateral, relatively sparse. Now we're beginning to get some semi-ill-defined ground glass opacity, but more consolidative, superior segment of left lower lobe. And then a little bit more in the left lower lobe, some ground glass, some consolidative. But that's basically it. Um, multifocal, multilobar, ground glass, attenuating and consolidative opacities in the lungs. So now they're more attuned to the possibility. So if they do a BAL, they now make sure to ask for oil red O staining in order to be able to ascertain the presence of vaping juice associated fat within macrophages. And I think the fat is the glycerin or something associated with the glycerin or perhaps the glycerin and something else. But in that kind of context, a young person previously healthy with this kind of illness and no other potential diagnosis, vaping and this kind of thing. We don't have eosinophilia here uh, one of the patients I showed a couple weeks ago did have, I think, 15% eosinophils, and that has been described in some patients with vaping-associated lung injury. But here you can see there is lipid within macrophages. So another case, and I think we're beginning to see this or suspected much more commonly now, we've had a total of four patients that I know of in the last, I think, three months. Hmm. <clears throat> one of which ended up on VV ECMO for a time, but these other patients like this one had much, much milder illness like that. Hmm. So keep an eye out for it. 
Was the attenuation? I too. I wonder if there's a component of air trapping going on here too. I don't know. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> that's very interesting. <clears throat> I think this person had slight lymph node enlargement. I think, well, perhaps a little. And I don't know if it's related, but these intrapulmonary lymphoid tissue down here within the lower lobes is certainly more than one usually sees, presumably reactive in some way to what's being inhaled. So Howard, do you think this is kind of a lipoid pneumonia then from what you're saying? I, I missed your earlier um, presentation. Certainly in the sense that there are macrophages with lipid, one could call it a lipoid. But I don't know that one should necessarily call it a lipoid pneumonia because what's in the airspaces may not actually be lipid. Mm -hmm. There is lipid within the macrophages, so one could usually use the term lipoid pneumonia, but I don't necessarily think that it's lipoid pneumonia because there's fat in alveoli, but mm. there's certainly fat within macrophages. So I don't know that lipoid pneumonia is necessarily a good term. Of course, we don't have lung biopsies. So I don't know what's actually within the alveoli. It's water. I don't know what's in the water, but not necessarily lipid. I mean, the lipids in macrophages. So I don't know. Just a uh, is it a cytokine mediated thing? Why do people get this? They've got all kinds of theories about what is actually going on within the lungs. And if it's eosinophils, eosinophil associated something, I don't know. But I have people, I've heard people use, use the term lipoid pneumonia to describe it. But I don't think yeah. this is, I don't think it's it's lipid. this is not, Big lobules of fat, no. Okay. But when they're when the people are talking about lipoid pneumonia, are they doing it in the context of vaping or in other lung conditions? I think in this particular context, the fact that these these patients have this kind of BAL result, and if you stain for oil and you see it in the macrophages, I think that prompts people to use the phrase lipoid mm -hmm. pneumonia. Got it. All right, David, may I give it over to you for a couple? Sure. Good. <clears throat> People see a chest radiograph. <clears throat> so uh, this radiograph I think is <clears throat> from um, a while ago <clears throat> on this person. And we see slightly low lung volume, but unremarkable lungs else other than that, maybe a little atelectasis down here, nothing too scary. Um, then on the, the next radiograph of interest is, um, let's see now, this is going to work for me. Okay, and the lateral is not particularly revealing. So here's the next uh, set of radiographs that we have on this person. At this point, there is a pneumothorax. <clears throat> which was um, asymptomatic, but what was dis discovered, uh, you know, when the person was being followed up, uh, after it was in the hospital because of a renal scan. So there was um, some imaging of the kidney. Let me show you the uh, chest CT that was obtained after this pneumothorax was discovered. And we do see the pneumothorax. And then we see a bunch of lung cysts that are concentrated in the bases. Here. And some of these are perivenous, and they don't have, they're not particularly elliptical or something like that, but basal lung cysts. And we get down to the kidney, um, you can see that there's this little tumor. And so the person was in, <clears throat> in the hospital for follow up scan on this little renal tumor. This is known Berthog de Bay disease. None of the notes mentions any skin findings, but that would be fibrofolliculomas would be the third finding. 
this um, this little lesion here, when they did these elaborate abdominal CT scans, was very slow to enhance, and it didn't enhance brightly like renal parenchyma or like a renal carcinoma. And it had been it was unchanged in size over the last two years, but might have grown slowly from a year before that. So very slow growth here. So this is probably one of the low grade <clears throat> renal tumors, like I think what are they called, chromophobe adenomas or something like that that go with maybe some other adenoma that yeah, goes with oncocytoma. Say, those. What is it? Oncocytoma is one of the renal lesions one may see. There's another there's another one too that okay. they are on that list. And then occasionally it's a frank renal carcinoma. Chromophobe. So, chromophobe. Okay. Is it chromophobe? Yes. That is was that true? I, or maybe that's maybe that's an endocrine tumor. I, um, yeah, no, I think um, Burkhoff's debate is associated with like clear cell and um, oncocytomas, but both like peak enhanced in the cortical medullary phase, not nephrographic. So I thought that was kind of uh, peculiar that it had a delayed enhancement. Okay. okay, very good. Okay, so this was uh, a nice case of Burkhoff's debate in the, the chest radiograph. Of course, it doesn't show those uh, basal cysts but they were manifested by leading to a pneumothorax. So um, here's a, another, this is part of the um, CT scan of the kidneys. And you can see that at this, in, in delay, there is some enhancement of this lesion, but it was relatively slow to enhance. They had different intervals when they had uh, rescanned this person to see the pattern of enhancement. So it was a, slow enhancement of that lesion down there. This person has a subtle uh, mediastinal mass uh, at the right apex. It had been pretty stable over last, the last year that we, which is all the follow-up that we have. And it's um, relatively anterior, but it's so large that it's pushing back posteriorly. There's no um, displacement of the trachea of note here. I think that's pretty much okay. I don't know, maybe lean on a little bit but it doesn't really seem to have much of a neck component down here. So looking at anterior mediastinal masses, uh, you know, we think of um, the possibility of thyroid, which, I mean, it definitely looks like thyroid juice, doesn't it? I mean, it's got yeah. low attenuation in it and it enhances quite a bit. We did have an outside non-enhanced CT scan that didn't show this brightness here and it's got some calcium in it. This would be pretty good for thyroid, but you know, it, you know, if it's thyroid, it should connect up with a thyroid gland in the neck. And you can see that there just isn't any connection. We have this rather small thyroid up here. We don't seem to be able to connect this big mass to thyroid. So they, um, they wrestled this thing out, they removed it, and um, it was fairly vascular. There were two big arteries that they had to um, they had to clip, I think. I don't know whether we're seeing them back here. I don't think so. But there was, you know, there was quite a bit of bleeding from this thing because it was vascular. They took care of those two arteries and everything was okay. And this is thyroid tissue with some nodular hyperplasia. So I think this qualifies since it's not connected to the thyroid gland as ectopic thyroid tissue. And if you want to say that there was nodular hyperplasia, you might say this is a kind of kind of a goiter. There was no malignancy associated with this, but this was they're calling it ectopic thyroid in the mediastinum here, away from the thyroid in the neck. So I've been waiting for a case like this, and I haven't. I don't. I don't have very many cases of ectopic thyroid. I'm not sure that I have any previous cases, but it's always been on the list for mediastinal tumors that are not connected to the thyroid gland itself. Evidently in embryogenesis, there are all these little thyroid rests um, that are, can be in the mediastinum, so it's not surprising. It's embryologically a known phenomenon, I guess. Mm. Okay. Yeah, very nice. So this case, uh, this case uh, looks a lot like the paraganglioma in terms of the dramatic enhancement that I showed a couple of weeks ago that I will, uh, I will be, I'll be posting as well. That was in the middle part of the mediastinum wasn't anterior like this <clears throat> and that enhanced quite a bit but that had ver visible vessels leading to it there was a lot of vessels and uh it was so vascular that 
uh, it was recognized right away by distinguished colleagues as a paraganglioma. Okay. So those have, are the have you ever seen uh, calcifications in a paraganglioma? I'm trying to think. Of course, I don't think too many, but I don't, I don't recall seeing dystrophic calcifications in a paraganglioma. That's that's a reasonable point. I have not seen that many paragangliomas, but yeah. the case I showed two weeks ago, I think, did not have calcifications. I'll check it. Okay. Those right. are my two cases. Good. Let me uh, show you some others. Ah, you'll like this one. Um, okay, so how should I present this case? Um, well, let me start here. I'm going to show you images from 2016 all the way to the current time and tell you initially that by virtue of the patient's history, which was predominantly that of a very troublesome and productive cough, that that started quite some time before 2016. And it's been going on for a long time. So here's a CT from 2016. And let me rotate this thing around just to uh, get it around. Where's my? I'll just swing it around like that, make it easy. So at some time X, she had this so-called high-res scan. There's some prone images and expiration, as you can see. And what is particularly dominant at that time in the right middle lobe is basically confluent ground glass attenuating opacity, most extensive in the anterior lobe, but the lower lobes are also affected. There's a small number of reticular opacities, of course, in the lower lung zones, not suggestive of any particular entity. And one might question the relationship between this and the reticular opacities, as in, are the reticular opacities a consequence of repeated episodes of a more acute or subacute process like this? in the lungs. But that's a representative image of what it looks like. I will tell you that, I'm going to withhold some information for the moment, but tell you that at another time point X, she was seen and labeled as having an interstitial lung disease. And she actually had a lung biopsy, a surgical lung biopsy. And no diagnosis was made on the surgical lung biopsy. A bunch of findings were seen but nothing could be put together. And provisionally, and I'm not entirely sure why, maybe on the part, maybe in part on the basis of the lung biopsy, she was labeled as having maybe chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. But I'm fairly confident that the lung pathologist who interpreted the surgical lung biopsy wasn't informed of the fact that this chronic productive cough was more than just a little productive. So now I'm going to show you well, let me first show you, before I even show you that, um, she's had multiple episodes. So here's the most recent one in April of this year. And scrolling through this, you'll see that we pretty much have the same findings. There's abnormality in the right middle lobe, but it looks like it did before. There is more of it in the lower lung zones on the current exam. But otherwise, the opacities are pretty much similar to what we've seen before. And... Again, we don't have other findings suggestive of any progressive interstitial fibrosis and lung disorder otherwise. So we have a bunch of years in which it's a productive cough. But now I'm going to show you <clears throat> some interesting findings. So I found in the EMR back in 2016 that someone actually took a photograph of the stuff that this person was coughing up and white firm structures, it says, and I'll mag that up. But as best I can tell, this is a plastic bag full of the white structures. 
interesting sample sent to the CDC. I don't know why the CDC, I wonder if that's a mistake, I don't know, eight-year history with no diagnosis made. So this is a lot of stuff. And then I will show you, now I don't know how big this container is, but this is what she's been coughing up intermittently. So this is the most recent one. So that is what she's coughing up. So this Yuck. is a very typical case of plastic bronchitis. And these things look huge. And I don't know the degree of magnification, but undoubtedly what was in that plastic bag years ago is the same stuff. So this is a case of, by virtue of this, idiopathic plastic bronchitis. Um, no surprise that the lung biopsy didn't reveal anything. And I made the comment here to myself, I don't know why they did the, the lung biopsy, what they were thinking of. I mean, she already had that back in 2016. So what's coming out of her lungs is what's in here. And in terms of you know, plastic bronchitis, um, there are a lot of classification schemes, but one classification scheme makes the big distinction between lymphatic disorders in which you have lymph material coming out or not. Another classification scheme seems to emphasize the pediatric causes of plastic bronchitis like the Fontaine and other related procedures. But there's always a category of non-lymphatic idiopathic plastic bronchitis. And some patients have in this material, if you examine it, a lot of um, eosinophils and charcoal laden crystals. So there may be another category of asthma or asthma-like conditions. But I think the diagnosis here is just a really difficult one, which is idiopathic plastic bronchitis that this person's had for, for all this time. And that's hmm. all I can really offer you in terms of refining this case. Looks as if there is some debris in that, in the right, the proximal bronchi there on the right. Um, you know, the, a uh, uh, little more slowly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there's some stuff in there, right. <clears throat> You know, Howard, is it ever associated with, say, a um, a mucinous, a mucin-producing bronchiolo alveolar cell carcinoma or low-grade adenocarcinoma? Could that be the, the cause of the protein that then gels in the airways and forms those casts? I don't think I've ever seen or heard of a patient with an adenocarcinoma produce such huge bronchial casts that are yeah. so big. I think just these secretions are probably more watery and less proteinaceous than this, too. Yeah, yeah. Of course, you can see pictures and case reports where you can see the shape of the bronchial tree. It must be really disturbing to cough up stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. That looks just really awful. So it's a really big dilemma in terms of treatment because if you don't have a lymphatic malformation, then all the articles you read about um, doing MR, lymphangiography, and the other things to try and basically evaluate the thoracic duct or lymphoid malformations to embolize them are not pertinent in that context because this is, like in this patient, not related to a lymphatic disorder per se. Mm. That's a real problem for, for management. Sorry. <clears throat> Oh, this is actually a very interesting case. So let me show you this case. Let's see how I should start with this case. Um, this is a patient that came to a surgeon here, referred to a surgeon here, <clears throat> with a history of a ventricular septal defect diagnosed some years previously. For reasons that are not clear, um, no particular surgical management was entertained then. I don't know exactly why. So the current imaging from June of this year that you see here is several years after it was initially diagnosed. And I don't know the context in which the diagnosis of it was made. So patient comes to up with a VSD. So let me show you the images here. Let's go from say down and up. So here we get to the level of left ventricular outflow tract approaching the aortic annulus and the aortic valve. 
and then we see the abnormality here that is manifested as calcifications. And then look at this very curious size of the right coronary sinus and the appearance of the sinus, how it appears distended. And here it actually bulges into the right ventricular outflow tract below the level of the pulmonic valve. And you can get a feel for how big that sinus is and where the RCA is coming up. So pulmonic valve, we go inferior to right ventricular outflow tract where we see this right there. So now I'm going to bring alongside that the different types of VSD. I don't do much cardiac imaging, so I had to remind myself. And different classification schemes are there for ventricular septal defects, but we have the muscular VSDs, we have the membranous, the perimembranous VSDs, and then we have this particular one, which is the so-called supracrystal VSD that accounts for a relatively small proportion of VSDs, where, as this one shows already, the defect lies beneath the pulmonic valve, communicates with the right ventricular outflow tract. You can get prolapse of right aortic cusp, as you see there. And that also correlates really nicely with these excerpts from the procedure that was performed. So you can see what was done in total. But if you read this, you can see how nicely this description and the calcifications correlates very nicely with what we see here in relation to the right coronary sinus, the right cusp and the calcium, as you can see right in here. <clears throat> I think it's maybe one, one of the first supracrystal VSDs, obviously here with some calcium that I've seen, and I think a particularly nice uh, example of it. As mm. you can see here. And the Howard, wind, could you, the could, wind could you actually see the communication? I'm sorry, could you actually see the communication, Howard, on the CT scan? Um, I don't know. I can't. You know, it's a matter of timing, perhaps, but I can't actually see, say, a spurt of contrast. Okay. And of course, there's calcium, right? <clears throat> Very closely associated with it, right in here, right? So the defect yeah. got to be right in there. But no, I don't mm -hmm. actually see, as in the passage okay. of contrast coming across it. But it's interesting. There were two defects communicating when sucking of the leaflet, debrided some calcium a small defect that they fixed with a patch of the defect itself. And then they also did a aortic roof with a bent off procedure as well. And they ended up with a small muscular base defect right there, as you can see there. Pretty nice example, right? I think it might be the first one I've seen. <coughs> It's better than 100% of my cases. It is 100% like of my cases. I'm not a cardiac imager, but I really like it. Yeah. All righty. I think we're going to stop a little bit early this week. I want to see if anyone has, in the audience, has made any comments or anything about any of these cases. I think not. All right, we'll adjourn for the week. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, David. Thanks, everyone. See you all next time. Next time. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.